Hi all, welcome back to the studio. Uh, talking about a really sensitive and emotive issue, in fact, uh, what I call the missing few. Uh, and it's an important conversation because it's quite clear that whereas people like us, aviation historians, aviation enthusiasts, uh, are aware that since the war, indeed since 1972, there have been numerous Battle of Britain aircrew, British and German, recovered from the wreckage of their aircraft in southern England. Uh, and what we're looking at with this is how, how can that be? And uh, how has this problem uh, evolved, the chronology of it and so on? Uh, and if you look at the introduction to the missing few, that explains the background as to why this has happened and uh, what has happened leading up to about 1977 when um, Branek Grushka had been recovered in 1974 and then there was the inquest, then there was the burial you see uh, and so on and it all started with the South African uh, Drake who was recovered in 72 then, then there's Grushka which is a complicated story all addressed in the introductory video uh, and then we've got the Germans, Gefreiter Richard Radel, uh, November 74, Leutnant Werner Knittel, uh, 109 pilots, these are 1973. Now, of course, just to recap, the reason for this is that the recovery services were overwhelmed during the Battle of Britain with the amount of scrap metal falling out of the sky. Uh, and in, in some of these marshy remote areas, these aircraft that, that crashed from grey height, you know, made, made a big impact and they went in, in deep, sometimes uh, deeper than it was, it, it, it was beyond the capability of the equipment available at, at the time. And of course, you know, these people are run ragged. So a lot of the wreckage will be recovered from the surface and taken away uh, and a cursory examination of what, of what, what remained of course, these aircraft at that time, they've got no intrinsic value, no historical value, just scrap metal at the end of the day. Um, and there, there are, sadly, aircrew casualties all over who, who, who have to be picked up and processed, you know. So, so it's, it, you can sort of understand why. What I can't understand, or what we're actually going to come on to, uh, and, and indeed, many of my friends can't understand who have been involved in this uh, since since day one it seems uh, it is why nothing is done about this and that is the rub isn't it so so let, let's just get back into this now so in 1975 the ministry of defense issued the first notes for guidance to recovery groups now these notes for guidance, we're going to look in detail in this video at, at the later ones, 1979, pretty similar, but they are aimed at preventing any further embarrassment in the Ministry of Defence at the end of the day, that uh, there would be no more missing pilots recovered uh, and deposited for the Ministry of Defence to deal with. Uh, potentially cause an embarrassment to a public who can't understand why this is understandable. So the only thing about the notes for guidance is that they had no weight in law. There, there is no law at this time regulating this activity that's now called aviation archaeology. So if you contravened those notes for guidance, the worst that could happen was that the Ministry of Defence would, would, would refuse to cooperate with you. So, in 1975, I suppose that, that was a bit difficult because RAF records were still in the public, still, they were not yet released into the public domain. Um, so, well, they were that year, actually, 1975, but, but it, you know, it's got no weight in law. There's nothing much going to happen. So, the activity continued and uh, in 1976, August 1976, the Wielden Group 
excavated the crash site of the Messerschmitt 110 uh, down at uh, Kingston Russell House at Long Breedy near Poole. Aircraft shot down. It's a Stura Geschwader 26 machine shot down 7th of October 1940, escorting the raid on Westland aircraft at Yeovil, uh, and recovered the remains of Oberfeld Webel, uh, Karl Herzog, and Obergefighter Herbert Schilling. So they end up. Um, being buried in the big German war cemetery on Canic Chase. So it's still going to go on, isn't it? Regardless of any notes for guidance. Then, uh, and this is actually a really interesting one, September the 11th, 1976, Sergeant, well, now let's track back a bit. Yeah. The London Air Museum excavated a hurricane crash site at Daniels Wood at Chewsnow near Bethesden and recovered the remains of a pilot uh, and a hurricane. The, it was known that that aircraft crashed uh, on the 17th of September 1940 and the only missing hurricane pilot that day was 501 Squadron Sergeant Eddie Egan. But because there was nothing recovered at the crash site to uh, identify the hurricane irrefutably, the Ministry of Defence refused to accept that identification. So the inquest was held 25th of February 1977 and it was decreed that the remains were unknown, which to me sounds ridiculous, quite honestly. That's pedantry gone mental. Uh, the pilot's sister, who I knew, Jane Somerville, uh, accepted that these were her brother's remains, which were buried as unknown at Brookwood Military Cemetery, joining some of the others who've been recovered. But the recovery groups in the South East, quite rightly, were unprepared to accept this. So, in November 1978, uh, a sort of cooperative of these groups re-excavated the Daniels Wood site and thankfully recovered a serial number, a plate with a serial number, P8 P3820, which conclusively identified that this was Eddie Egan's hurricane. So at that point, there was there was no no question now, none at all. It's Sergeant Eddie Egan, and Sergeant Egan's grave was then named at Brookwood. Now, one thing about that, so Sergeant Tony Pickering. Uh, who was actually the first Battle of Britain pilot I met about 40 years ago. Uh, Tony was flying with Eddie Egan that day, and he told me that uh, they saw behind them 109s that they actually thought were Spitfires to start with. And one of the 109s shot forward, uh, left the others standing, randomly picked Eddie and not Tony, shot him down, Tony turned to face the attack and the 109s made off, which was typical of these diving high-speed passes, bam, 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 and away. And there's video on the channel about German fighter tactics, which I find fascinating as well. So, of course, Tony gets back to Kenley and reports where Eddie's crashed. He saw him go in, in a wood, uh, reported exactly the location, uh, heard no more of, of Eddie Egan, until uh, he's identified and buried at Brookwood uh, and it's all over the press. And Tony's thinking, well, how, how, how did that happen when I saw him go in and I accurately reported the location in 1940? So all that's a bit odd. But anyway, thanks to the, the archaeologists, thanks to the enthusiasts, Eddie Egan's brought in from the coal. Then, 1st of October 1977, Oberleutnant Eckhard Schlecker, uh, he is recovered, a JG-54 Emmy 109 pilot. Um, crash site at um, Mountain Street, Chillum in Kent. Uh, and the landowner have refused permission for, for a recovery for years, but eventually gave permission the 590 Explosive Ordnance Disposal Unit, which was a 
territorial army formation. And um, on this occasion, in fact, when the recovery took place, Mike Newellin, founder of the Camp Battle of Britain Museum, who'd been embroiled in the Grushka controversy, was actually called in to help, to help with the identification of the aircraft uh, and so on. Uh, and, and as Mike said to me, and I quoted it in the book that I, I wrote because I thought it was important to have a narrative, it's an old book now, 1998, uh, uh, Missing in Action, Resting in Peace, which provides a chronology to all of this, uh, revisited in Battle Brick Remembered, um, Volume 8 of the official series, which sort of recaps and updates the whole thing since 98. Uh, but as Mike said, you know, at, at the inquest for Schlecker, uh, he was praised by the coroner, which was uh, a direct contrast to the Groschka fiasco. Uh, you just can't win, Mike says. So he's right. So clearly, more problems. The notes for guidance didn't stop this happening. So, July 1979, we have more notes for guidance issued to these recovery groups. And the, the, this is uh, uh, concerns crash military aircraft of historical significance, is what, what they say. And uh, they cover things like the ownership of the aircraft once it's recovered, uh, and retention of recovered items. Um, basically, it is uh, the property of the Crown, until such time as the Crown decide to pass rights of ownership to somebody else, in this case, the recovery group. So, um, the idea was that all items recovered should be reported, which is still the case today, to the Ministry of Defence, and if there were no issues, the rights of ownership would be transferred. Um, it says that permission to recover is obviously uh, required from the landowner and indeed the Ministry of Defence. Um, and it also goes on with a bit of a threat here. It says uh, recovery, uh, 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 unlawful interference with Crown property could lead to civil or criminal proceedings. Uh, nobody ever won and it draws particular attention to uh, firearms, ammunition and explosives uh, and human remains. So they're very conscious of it. Covers entry to land, wreckage line in coastal waters. Um, this, is, um, uh, this is quite complicated actually because it's not just you know, the Crown owns the foreshore, I think it is, the, um, what's it, forget now. And then you've got the, um, the local receiver wrecked, if it was, you know, a, a wreck at sea. Quite a complicated scenario. Um, gives advice about safety precautions, firearms, ammunition, and explosive. And, um, and then it goes on about human remains. Um, and, and quite sensible, really, what it says. It says, in many cases, crews will have escaped from aircraft before they crash, but there is still a possibility of human remains being found. These must not be touched, and they, they should be treated with due respect. Their discovery must be reported immediately to the police and military defence. Uh, recovery activities must be suspended, and nothing should be taken from the site until both the Royal Air Force and the police have made their investigation, and the human remains have been removed. The feelings of relatives of deceased aircrew cannot be emphasized too strongly. Irrever irreverent handling of human remains would be particularly distressing to them, and it is most important that no information about the discovery of human remains should be given to presumed relatives, or the news media, or indeed anyone outside the police or the Ministry of Defence, until the facts have been properly confirmed. Now that's actually quite sensible. And there is a case that we're going to talk about in the next video, I think, uh, where there was a... you'll see why, anyway. So, and the, the, the Ministry of Defence will take all necessary steps to notify the next of kin or other relatives. And in no circumstances is a recovery group to act in this respect. Well, very often, the relatives have been traced before the deeds take place anyway. With, with a lot of these, the, the families are already on site 
uh, and, are, and are at a loss to understand why the authorities are not actually doing something proactive um, to, to recover the aircraft anyway. Um, and this is the problem. The MOD's uh, policy has always been one of non-disturbance, of letting sleeping dogs lie effectively, not wanting really to open the floodgates to, to absolutely countless missing uh, situations, um, which, which is understandable, but is it? And in some of these circumstances, where there is so much strong evidence pointing to the fact that a pilot remains with the aircraft, uh, you, you've got to ask yourself whether this should, these should be addressed on a case-by-case -case basis and not just a generic no, we're not doing anything about it, whether the relatives like it or not. And we'll come on to that as well. It really is a complicated situation that develops over time. So anyway, there we are. There's the notes, notes for guidance. So, did it stop anything? What effect did it have? Not a great deal. In fact, the rate of recoveries of missing aircrew actually increased. So, in the next video, that's what we're going to look at. These other uh, recoveries taking us up to 1986 when something really significant happened. Um, and we'll talk about that too. So, thanks for listening. These are all segmentary videos, if you like, following this whole story that's quite complicated, too complicated to do in one video. So we'll do it in bite-sized chunks and move along. Because it's really surprising now uh, that those of us who've been around for a long time, fully familiar with all of this, that so many people who've come on the scene more recently have got, got no idea about it. So it's a conversation uh, and it's a discussion and it's, it's an important emotive issue. Uh, and we should all be aware of it, really. So thanks for listening. Any feedback, comments, good or bad, in the comments box below. If you like the channel, um, like the idea of building this community of really, I think, connoisseur Battle of Britain historians and enthusiasts, not just some roll-up, roll-up, razzmatazz thing. We're, going, we're talking about serious history here, and serious, serious issues. Um, if you like what we do, subscribe. It's all free. You can watch for free. So, there we are. The second installment of the missing queue. And I shall now go straight on and film the third. So, thanks for listening. And uh, I'll see you soon.